Awesome. Hello and good morning. We are the CFA Institute Research Challenge Team representing Portland State University. And today we're going to be issuing a whole recommendation on lithium orders. My name is Daniel Paul and I'm accompanied here by my fellow teammates, Joseph Khalil, Rania Mercio, and then Matt Kunke. Lithium Motors is a leading operator in the automotive franchise industry, operating with both uh, new and used vehicles as well as related services. As of February 19, 2016, Lithium closed the trading day at $84.97, which represents a 5.7% upside to our current one-year target price of $89.89. Thus, we're going to be issuing a hold recommendation based on these four characteristics. Lithia operates in four main business segments, including new vehicles, used vehicles, service body and parts, and finance, insurance, and other. And as of today, they currently have 139 locations throughout the United States. Lithia's limited growth opportunities begin with their demand drivers. U.S. GDP is anticipated to grow at an annualized rate of 2.2% for the upcoming 10 years, based off of information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The characteristics incorporated in this growth rate include the declining labor participation, diminishing productivity, and slow inflation. All these characteristics combined help create a slow and consistent growth. Disposable income is anticipated to grow at an annualized rate of 2.5% in the upcoming years. Several factors incorporated in this growth include the improvement in stock values, the increased number of Americans returning to the workforce, and the improved housing market. Our pest analysis also displayed a few limited growth opportunities. First, the EPA recently uh, issued a regulation requiring fleet-wide fuel efficiency standards of 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025. The implementation of this regulation creates additional costs that will trickle down to both the retailers and the consumers. De uh, decreasing gasoline prices will encourage consumers to continue to purchase new vehicles uh, while not having to worry about the fuel efficiency of the vehicle. Millennials have also uh, become a larger part of the car market and their preferences have become more influential. They are purchasing fewer vehicles than previous generations, and their license ownership is diminishing. We've also begun to see the introduction of autonomous vehicles into the car market. Autonomous vehicles are anticipated to be fully integrated into the car market by the year 2020. Once fully integrated, they are expected to decrease vehicle sales by 40% and decrease vehicles per household by 50%. The changing sociological norms around vehicle ownership in a continually urban, urbanizing country indicate that the continuous double-digit growth rate of the auto dealership industry is unsustainable. Listed above are the merits for both Lithia and their competitors shown above here. Highlighted right here in the red, as you can see, are the gross margins across all seven companies. And as you can see, they're all relatively similar. <coughs> there are about 17,800 dealerships within the United States. And the top 10 dealerships only represent about 7% of those locations, indicating that the, comp the competitive nature of the industry is forcing these companies to compete on margins. Also, listed up here are the number of locations and acquisitions performed by each of these respective companies in the year 2014. Inflated because of their acquisition of DCH Auto Group in 2014, which represents 27 of those 35 locations listed up above, Lithia will continue to expand by acquiring other dealerships in order to expand their brand presence. Lithia, we project Lithia will have a cash conversion cycle of 42, 42 days for the upcoming periods as they achieve efficiency on par with their peers. While there appears to be growth, uh, growth opportunities available to grow that cash conversion cycle, as shown through that increase in the stretching of the days payable out saving, we believe that it is unlikely that Lithia will realize any additional growth or achieve any additional growth in their gross margins that would constitute for a share price premium. While Lithia has achieved uh, really extraordinary growth through acquisitions in recent years, in evaluating their forward prospects, we thought it was important to separate out what is their organic growth versus what is their growth driven through acquisitions. So as you can see from this chart here, we use a variety of valuation methods to evaluate Lithia's uh, per share value. We had three driven from our discounted cash flow model, including the FCFF, FCFE, and APV models. We used three relative valuation models, including Blue Sky, EV EBIT, and EV EBITDA. And we also calculated the takeover value. While our one-year target price of 89.89 is driven through a relative valuation, which we'll speak to in a moment, we do believe that our discounted cash flow model provides the best indication of their ongoing intrinsic value of operations. 
So our discounted cash flow model was a three-phase model as we felt that Lindsay would not be in a steady growth state after a typical five-year explicit forecast period. So phase one, which is 2016 through 2020, includes a dynamic line item forecast of the income statement balance sheet and statement of cash flows. Phase two, which is 2021 through 2025, includes a forecast of just our key line, uh, cash flow line items, and then we have slowing growth rates to start to normalize Lithia's current double digit growth towards what we believe their terminal growth rate to be. Phase three, which is our terminal phase, use a constant growth model to calculate terminal value. Uh, and then we also use three separate costs of capital for each of the phases to better mes match discount rates to their associated cash flows. This here is a tree map chart which shows the relative size of each of, the, each of Lithia's revenue streams over the five-year explicit forecast period of phase one. So we've outlined our key revenue and cost of sales forecast assumptions for each of those line items. We just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that we expect margins to continue to decrease for new and used vehicle sales. Recently, Auto Nation made a splash in industry news when they issued guidance stating that they expected margins to decrease even as sales continued to increase. This is largely due to increased use of manufacturing incentives and dealership promotions to push unit sales, um, sometimes at the expense of margins. Uh, in addition, the advent of online comparison shopping has really enabled consumers to drive a hard bargain when they go in to purchase their vehicles. Use vehicles as they're less comparable and the dealership can control the margins on them a little bit more. We expect that to decrease at a lower rate than our new vehicle margins. So once we had built our organic sales forecast and the rest of that model, we layered acquisitions on top of that. Using a historic cash to sales ratio, we forecast the amount of operating cash necessary for Lithia's normal operations. And then the excess cash we had generated from our organic model is what we used to build our acquisitions. We assumed that cash spent on acquisitions would be equal to 10% of the revenue acquired through that acquisition based on recent Lithium management guidelines. Uh, we should also note that the sales forecast through the acquisition model shows an exponential growth as opposed to a linear growth in the organic model. As if the company makes an acquisition in one year, they have that non-organic acquisition growth, which is then organic, same store growth in all subsequent years. Despite that uh, exponential growth in sales, we did not see a commensurate increase in our intrinsic valuation. Uh, we believe acquisitions provide. Um, we believe acquisitions provide upside in market share and geographic dispersion. However, uh, the downside risk we think outweighs the upside potential. For the case of Lithia, primarily due to a competitive acquisition environment, as well as a, a changing trend in transportation, uh, a changing transportational trend, in the urban populations, which implied to us that the premium paid for these franchises would not be commensurate with the returns generated, and therefore we think uh, a organic free cash flow model is our best indicator of intrinsic value. So to further dive into some of our key value drivers, we integrated a Monte Carlo simulation into our organic FCFF model. We, simulate, uh, we modeled 13 of our key value drivers as triangularly distributed random variables and calculated a median value of $85.18 per share through 100,000 iterations. While we believe a free cash flow uh, based approach is our best model of value in the long run, in a short term time horizon, we cannot expect, we don't believe markets are efficient, and we cannot expect the market to correct itself to an intrinsic value, uh, to an intrinsic value cash flow based price. So we decided to, we, we arrived at our, uh, at our target price of 89.89 by taking a median of a organic blue sky and acquisition blue sky model, which are more relative approaches. The blue sky model is the default for the automotive uh, dealership industry. One minute. And, and it's a, uh, and it's, and it, it's a, uh, it's a model that takes a uh, net tangible value plus a blue sky value, which is an estimate of intangible value. And then you get a multiple between one and seven, which you, uh, you take operating income at times one and seven based off of the operating efficiencies, uh, franchise location, uh, brand mix, and other intangible values to arrive at an equity value, and then from there you can drive for share values. And then from, from there, well, we, we said that this is our best multiple methodology because it's an industry standard and it applied to us that other market participants would be using it. And therefore, from that, it would set price some. It would be the best multiple to use. And just to reiterate, we have a target price of 89.89, and we are recommending a hold.
this concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. We'll not take questions. submitted your, your report, the, the stock has gone up to, as Carl said, 95 and change, and we've had the benefit of a, of a fourth quarter report, which was a positive surprise. Um, given what you know now, this may or may not be fair, but it has nothing to do with your presentation, but to answer the question, what's your rating on the stock now? Well, I don't think it's changed. Um, when the fourth quarter results were released and we took a look at the earnings call transcript, their 2015 results were actually slightly less than what we forecast for year end. Um, which means that our overall forecast may be slightly optimistic. In that call, they also adjusted uh, down expectations for 2016 operating results. So we feel that maybe not in the one-year time horizon, but certainly in the long run, we're going to see a correct downward. Um, one of the things you guys obviously highlighted a lot here, and probably rightly so, was the company's um, growth through their purchase and acquisition strategy. How do you how do you incorporate the company's um, capital structure and financial flexibility into evaluating that strategy? Uh, yeah, so the management has stated in their third quarter call and also when we had our conference call that they are looking at strategy delevering. Uh, they are a little bit levered relative to the industry right now, and so when we had our cost of capital forecast, we actually took them down to that, that ca industry capital structure by the terminal phase. So it's possible if they decide not to pursue that strategy of delivering, they could have more money available for acquisitions. I suppose it was also mentioned actually in the 10K that they also seek other alternatives also. I mean, we, it's been pretty inconsistent, but if you actually look at their 10K, they've been attempting to also pay out dividends as well as they mentioned a, a share repurchase also. While those kind of just, they lay there as an alternative, uh, for their excess cash, it hasn't been very much consistent, and we generally kind of keep that on the table as an alternative to acquisitions as well. What impact would the proposed state of Oregon 2.5% tax on companies with revenue over $25 million have? It would have a fairly large impact only because uh, approximately 20 to 25% of all of our revenues come here from Oregon specifically in their locations. But now we've actually been starting to notice that uh, all of their locations and all the dealerships that they're acquiring is within Southern California and kind of following that same DCH strategy on the east side as well. So not as much as much. And as we saw with their release of the 10K, that California has now uh, become the largest uh, revenue sector. We also did have their effective tax rate, which has been yeah. decreased, normalizing to a statutory rate by our terminal phase. How, can you just give us at a high level how, you did, how you're trying to determine uh, an equity risk premium for these guys in your DCS models? Yeah, um, so we have an equity risk premium uh, change just three times. We have three phases. We did a historic uh, equity risk premium for the first two based off the Modern's published uh, returns of S&P versus 10 year risk free. Or well, I guess the first one's a five year for duration matching our bonds. So we have uh, equity risk premium based on historic term returns with the S&P 500 and a five year risk free rate for phase one. And then a 10 year and a 10 year risk free rate in phase two. And then we use the Duff and Phelps forward looking premium for uh, our terminal, our, our terminal value. You write in your report, it's not your presentation, maybe it's not fair game, but maybe comment just for general industry knowledge. What, what's the effect of the Volkswagen emission scandal on the metal field in particular? I, I don't think, well, my initial statement was, I think the car, the, just the automotive industry has seen, been very resilient historically with GM and all these big scandals. I, I think it was something they'll blow over personally, but all of them. Yeah, so actually, if you saw the acquisition of DCH Auto Group, the majority of all their uh, vehicles are all imports. And as we know that the import vehicle, import vehicles were kind of kind of tarnished a little bit after the Volkswagen uh, emissions scandal. And considering the the, you know, the impact of the number of import vehicles they may have, it may send a, a negative image towards those vehicles specifically. And consumers may move towards maybe domestic vehicles or even some of the luxury vehicles that they have as well. But there has definitely been increasing that percentage of those import vehicles, which have been affected by that. And, and, and Olivia, excuse me, used to be the largest uh, dealer of Chrysler Dodge, I, I, I've been told over many, many years. Now, now what's their largest uh, brand that they sell? 
the largest rank from what I remember had to be, it, it included uh, Dacia, Toyota, and there were a few other vehicles that were it's, in it's there. It's an import, yeah. Yeah. Like you said, mm -hmm. but you, don't, you don't know which one. Okay. It's fine. Can you uh, explain to us what floor plan financing is and what, what kind of impact that has on your evaluation of the company's um, uh, capital structure and financial situation? So floor plan financing is a short-term variable rate financing that they get either from the OEM, the car manufacturer directly, which is listed as trade on their financials, or it's not trade, which means they got it from a third-party financing. Uh, financing. So we would count this somewhat similar to accounts payable when we're talking about that operating working capital calculations and things like that. However, we did include the non-trade floor plan financing as part of debt in our capital structure calculations. Can you comment about the securitization of auto loans, analogous to the uh, 08 mortgage loan fiasco and, and, and subprime loans that may be exposed to, uh, to the company? Um, I'm not sure if I follow exactly. Can I comment on how it affects them? Does the company have hold any uh, any bad loans as a residual of the loans, or do they sell them off to uh, to get securitized? I, I didn't see anything in the ten K pertaining to securitization of their loans. Are they yeah, their financing? Uh, New York Times has been uh, has written about this. This in, in two thousand fifteen. You might, you might Google that and read all of Back to the floor plan financing, you see you counted as debt. If, if the car doesn't sell, what, what's the option to satisfy that floor plan uh, obligation? They're still required to pay the floor plan financing. There might be some more. Or they can get the car OEM. back, so, right? This is a non-trade where it's not through the yeah, OEM. Yeah, it's not trades through a third-party oh, okay. financing, so they wouldn't have any recourse. recourse. Okay. And maybe been, I'm thinking OEM. They've had a huge divergence from how they're financing. It used to be a lot more trade. Now it's almost entirely non-trade financing for their forward plan. Okay, well then, I don't understand it correctly. Um, um, so based on your research, what, what do you think um, What do you think the biggest change in the uh, auto industry will be over the next 20 years? Uh, the big thing, obviously, is the autonomous vehicles that we've seen, which will cause uh, not only just a decrease in vehicles sold, but also within their service and parts because the autonomous vehicles will help decrease uh, collisions and accidents. We also talked a little bit about in the presentation about the shifting, uh, the shifting view of vehicles as millennials are now kind of shifting away from it. As there are alternative modes of transportation available, when you start looking at little smart park cars where you can rent on, a, on an hourly basis rather than just purchasing a car outright, I mean, definitely the, the the, the millennials are definitely moving away from it as they're starting to go towards more city-like urban areas where you know they're not having to move as much, not having to really purchase a vehicle and solidify that sort of commitment. So it's definitely changing that. And as we saw with the their, uh, diminishing license ownership, uh, mainly in the uh, millennials from ages 16 through, I believe it was 24, they had near, in each age group it was difference between, I think it was 10 to 20, percent decrease in license ownership since uh, the 1980s. You spoke about stalling efficiency, but I, I read somewhere that uh, Lithia's uh, percentage of SG&A as a portion of uh, gross profit is coming down quite markedly. Have you ever heard of that uh, that ratio, SG&A to, to gross profit? And, and do you agree that's been coming down and that does show efficiency, a direction towards efficiency or no? It has historically, our, our premise is that we don't think that's there in the future. It, it's come down a lot, but yeah, our premise is that we think there's a lot of roadblocks in the future and they can't go much lower. One minute. They also had an increase in SGA as a percent of gross profit when they were integrating the DCH acquisition. CS so did go down a bunch after they fully integrated that acquisition, but it's normalizing towards their historical numbers. There was some decrease, but not a lot. Um, they are the industry leader in that, we just don't think we have much room to squeeze it for you mentioned te uh, California is now their largest market according to the 10K, which is kind of new information. Is, is that good or bad? Well, that's good and bad both. Um, only because uh, Texas used to be their largest uh, largest percentage of revenue, but as you've kind of seen, the, the economy's kind of been hurt after energy prices have been absolutely 
just dumping, you know, recently in the news. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the economies are being affected and those consumers aren't going out purchasing vehicles. And Lithia has, they've generally had uh, quite a bit of acquisitions there in the California region, in the Northern California region at least. And following their acquisition of uh, DCH Auto Group, the latest uh, acquisition was actually in Riverside, California. Nice. Which, 